Hey, welcome to a, another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here and checking out the series. Uh, please do hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week. So it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. And I got to tell you, I'm so excited today. Martin Fry of ABC is here. Hello. Hello there. It's a, Greetings it's a, from London today. <laughs> yes. No I'm so yeah no, I, how is it over there yeah yes yeah, all good just recovering after the platinum jubilee there was a five-day holiday last week to celebrate 70 years of the queen so uh london's rocking now yeah people are just kind of nursing the hangovers i think yeah a five-day holiday i mean we will we'll look for a celebration for anything but uh that's not a bad one to have right there i gotta i gotta imagine that was kind of exciting to be around uh, once every 70 years yeah yeah <laughs> Cannot wait till the next comet comes by. And that's yeah, uh... exactly. <laughs> Well, uh, that's not the only anniversary, is it? We're also talking about uh, 40 years ago, as it were. Uh, yeah. That's the, uh, that's the 40th. This is the 40th anniversary of the Lexicon of Love. You're going to be taking it out on tour. Uh, how, how's this feeling? I mean, obviously, it comes to a point, I think somebody said, um, like, you get an album like this, you end up having to celebrate it like every five years after a while. Uh. The way I see it is everybody has a birthday someday, don't they? Every single day of the year. So, but um, since we kind of, ABC formed way back when in the early 80s, 1982. So four decades has gone by, believe it or not, since our debut album, The Lexicon of Love. Um, so somebody suggested it would be a good idea to celebrate, yeah. Uh, in the UK, we're just starting a tour, uh, an orchestration tour. Uh, the band, the or South Bank Symphonia Orchestra and Dudley conducting uh, it's quite an extravagant show. When we come to play in uh, North America and surrounding areas, uh, we strip it back to the band. But within the band, I get the chance to play a lot of songs from the Lexicon of Love, our album, that came out all those years ago, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But uh, on the Lexicon of Love, there was a Look of Love, Poison Arrow, All of My Heart, various songs, yeah. Yeah. So can you tell me where 10, year, uh, ten years goes by? 15 minutes is a long time in the... Uh, the world of rock and roll so can you tell me where four decades has gone yeah. right right well i know it's been well celebrated for that entire four decades too i mean this is uh, looked at as she's one of the greatest albums of all time and you know not That's everybody can to say that but uh, lots of albums have been made uh, <laughs> the funny thing is in music though um if you kind of been there for more than 10 minutes you kind of go in cycles you know i remember in the 90s i reached a point after a pretty busy 1980s people go what are you still here but then a couple of weeks goes by and they go you're a legend you're a national treasure you know and uh, you get off i mean ask bruce springsteen or the rolling stones i'm sure they'd say the same thing yeah, yeah. now the the 10 year uh, i've noticed that with a lot of bands um with most bands the cycles that you're talking about uh there, there is the the first 10 years you, you know you can have all the success but once you make it to the 10 to the 10 to 10 year mark nobody wants you but if you no, make it to the 20 year mark, you're great. <laughs> yeah, you get to climb the mountain again and you redevelop your skills. And obviously, in our case, yeah, we had a whole bunch of MTV hits through the 1980s. It goes quiet for a while. But then you uh, get out on the road and do various things. I'm, making, I'm still making new records. I made an album called Lexicon of Love 2 about five years ago. Mm -hmm. But um, the emphasis is on uh, getting out there and performing live. If you can stagger along through 10 years, yeah, anybody needs a, you know, they, they deserve a medal for that. Because believe me, when we started, I never thought we'd last more than 45 seconds. You know, <laughs> getting away with it. Yeah, definitely. It, it's it's going to be interesting, though, because, you know, you're, you're a fan uh, of music. Yeah. You know what, you, when you think of the greatest albums of all time, certain albums will come to mind to you. And, and to have a, a large population say that about a piece of art no. that you've done. I mean, and you've yeah. done great albums throughout your career, but when, when you, you know, they pinpoint something like that, they're putting you in the same league as the ones maybe that you conjure up. Does that give you a different feeling towards that record itself? Not really, in a funny kind of way, no, but it's kind of a total honor and it's a great privilege to get on stage, you know, seriously. I, I'm joking earlier about, you know, just kind of winging it. Uh, and kind of chancing my way through 40 years. It is a great honor to stand on stage and for, you know, to be able to sing a song you've written all those years ago and to hear the audience singing it back at you, that's a magical feeling. Um, I think this, I mean, for me, a classic album is something like Sly Stone, uh, there's a riot going on or 
uh, you know, Roxy Music Avalon, maybe, or Ziggy Stardust, or Marvin Gaye, what's going on? You know, everybody has their own particular favorite. But I think um, for something to become a classic, it's all about the audience, they decide. Because as soon as you finish a piece of work, it becomes public property, I think, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. So it's got nothing really to do with me, you know, so I don't, I don't kind of sit at home and look at my reflection in the platinum <laughs> records. Uh, I kind of believe that it's a great honor to be able to carry that torch forward, you know, so because of many, many albums have been made through the, through the last 50 years, obviously, or, or even longer. But it's it's a wonderful feeling to know that people still remember the music and um, and value it, you know. And and a whole new generation comes along and checks out what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we become part of a um, part of an era, I suppose. You know, people rep you represent, you know, just as Dylan represents the '60s with "Blowing in the Wind" or something. You know, um, Duran Duran, ABC represent the kind of 1980s, I suppose. Yeah, early '80s, that all that kind of. That era of um, ambition and um, unbridled kind of belief in the future, which is very different to now, but uh, yeah, a more flamboyant time. Yeah, it's interesting thinking about you know, especially when you were coming out, when when you were doing, when yeah. you all were developing the sound of ABC, as you're saying that, and in the early '80s, because you. For all look at history, you sort of went against the grain of, of what was happening right then. I mean, there were it seemed like there were a lot of people wanting to be trailblazers, which was great. Cause I don't feel like that happens as much these days. There's a lot of, a lot more feels like follow the leader happening, but, but when you yeah. came out, you did, it seemed like, did you, was, was that really as conscious as it seems that you all went the other direction? I mean, you weren't a post-punk band in England at the time when that was so much no. of a thing. I love the Sex Pistols and the Clash, Susie and the Banshees, the punk bands. I used to go and see them all, when, you know, as a teenager. Subway Sec, Buzzcocks, you know, new, Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers were an incredible band, all these punk bands. But when it came to kind of work your own band and form a band uh, as a much, as a younger generation, we kind of wanted to bring in a lot of different things. Uh, and in a funny kind of way, in Sheffield, north of England, we'd go and play our set and I'd be wearing my sparkly tuxedo. You know, it was the kind of opposite of, of the kind of post-punk scene, you know. So you'd wind people up. I've always thought there's a great value in irritating an audience and kind of seeing people kind of flip, you know, and in response. And I've always loved artists like, like Dylan, you know. What about when Dylan went electric? You know, they say people threw stuff at the stage, you know, how wrong they were. Or um, for me, I love the New York Dolls or the Velvet Underground, Bowie and Roxy. Those acts came along and people didn't really like them at first, you know, but they were, the, they, they were kind of a, a taste of what the future was about. They were trailblazers, uh, Iggy Pop, someone like that, you know, the Stooges, loads of stuff. And uh, Steely Dan, I love, but um, I kind of like the trailblazers, yeah. And in a way, uh, we've always wanted to kind of sidestep what was going you can't just follow a trend it's not like working in a bank or jo joining the army when you form a band it, you, you don't have to follow any rules it's better not to follow any rules you know so i think on the one hand that served me well with abc we came along in our gold army suits our tuxedos singing our romantic songs to a really punky audience who came around you know kind of thought this is the next building block in, in music. But I think that's every generation's birthright. I think today, as we speak in 2022, there's an act, there are acts out there that are doing exactly the same thing, you know, mm -hmm. facing the flack and moving, you know, creating something uh, that's a little bit different. I think that's really important to try and be original. I definitely, I still believe that all these years on. However, it sometimes means that those qualities that make you strong are kind of also a bit self-destructive. You know what I mean? You kind of, you know, you build that success up and that following and you can, you can knock it down again. But we've always tried to make records that were kind of different each time. You know, I mean, someone like Prince was an incredible innovator. You know, he's got his kind of unique style across all of his music, but he come along, you never quite knew what to expect next. Right. People don't really work in that way now. You know, it's different. Today, it's all about kind of building the perfect car. It's like you're Elon Musk and you're in a band. You know, they're taking elements and trying to build something uh, musically that works. I hope that makes sense. It does. It, I, it, uh, well, it's, it, it's, it's interesting because, you know, basically what you just said was 
you did the punk thing. I mean, you went up against punk yeah. crowds by being exactly what they stood for against yeah. going against the grain against themselves. I know I'm not the first one to say that, but that's, that's so funny when you kind of wrap it around like that. Seriously, I love John Lydon and Public Image, and, but, but the original, when I'd go and see the Pistols, as I say, the Clash, Slaughter and the Dogs, or uh, Buzzcocks in Manchester, um, all the bands were kind of about that anarchy, that self-freedom, you know, mm -hmm. freedom of expression. And um, uh, it kind of sticks with you all through your life. It's a funny thing, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I kind of thought, well, there's no way I'm going to form a band and try and be like Lydon and, and Steve Jones and Glenn Matlock and Paul Jones, you know, the Pistols. It, it would be pointless. Just as in Sheffield, there was a band that uh, Def Leppard were there. They were, they were incredible, you know, before they were, so you saw them play bars and stuff. Same with the Human League, who were a very defined sort of electronic synthesizer band. And you kind of knew you had to be, beat your own rhythm, find your own path. I think I sound like a really old guy giving advice to a younger audience, and I hope that's not the case. <laughs> I don't think it's oh, coming across like that. A complete waste of time. And two, I know nothing. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen it yet, but have you watched the new uh, Pistols film yet? Funny, uh, my, I was a friend of mine, Mike Pickering, I met him this morning, and he was saying he'd seen it. We were discussing it this morning. I've not seen it yet, no. Yeah, yeah. But he's pretty good. I mean, Danny Boyle knows how to entertain the public, doesn't he? We like train spotting and, you know, countless other movies he's made. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that. I think everybody I'm likes it so far except Leiden. There's a Madonna, yeah, well, Leiden. <laughs> well, you know, it's his life. You know, I guess he's every right not to like it. Sure, yeah. sure. But, you know, he was there. You know, he was there, mate, on it. Uh, there's going to be a Madonna biopic. Uh, uh, and I want to see the Elvis film. This, mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about this Elvis movie. They say it's really good, so I'm interested. Again, I mean, you know, we put our trust in Boston. Rocket, so. Rocket Man was okay, you know, and kind of the Queen movie. But there is a vogue now for biopics, isn't there? Obviously, yeah. who would have thought that all these years? Now? Where's the ABC movie? That's the, where's, where it is? Uh, where's the Martin Fry movie? Yeah, get Sean Bean in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he can blame me. He's from Sheffield. Yeah, he's craggy, like me. Yeah, get him. He's in. He's in Snowpiercer on on uh, Netflix. Mm. I guess. I hope we're getting the same Netflix that you're getting. Yeah. So yeah. maybe you could take a break from Snowpiercer and come and do the ABC story. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think who else I'd cast. Actually, that's quite a daunting idea of uh, who you'd cast. Who would you cast? Like, right. Movie. Yeah. 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 I don't get the same luxury. No one wants to watch the. Uh... The you story do. about the do it guy doing uh, Zoom interviews, uh, you know, three, they, three, they, four they, times they, a week. There'll be, there'll be, a, there'll be, a, a, there'll be a script soon. Yeah, <laughs> your story. Everybody will have a bio. Andy Warhol said everybody will be famous, uh, you know, for the next fifteen minutes. Well, I say everybody's going to have a, a Netflix documentary in the next fifteen years. Yeah, yeah, that's my prophecy. Yeah. Well, I, I do want to ask a, a little bit more about uh, about the anniversary and everything. Um, you know, the big singles that you were mentioning, uh, All of My Heart, I think these days, that's the one I go to mostly. That's the one, if you know, if, I, if I'm just punching in or something on the record, like that's, I don't know what it is. That one sits really still in that that great pocket spot for me all these years later. Uh, just what, what comes to mind with that one? I, I don't really have a specific question, but I would love to hear about it. Uh, all of My Heart, it was a big tune in actually in the, yeah, the UK and Europe, perhaps less so in America. I don't think it came out as a single. But uh, every band has to have a kind of tearjerker song. You know, when they climb on stage, I guess you too do one, don't they? That tune and uh, In Excess always had a kind of bit of a tearjerker tune. Every band has the moment. Uh, you know, Prince had Purple Rain, didn't he? So we have All of My Heart, which is a kind of bittersweet song, um, a kind of emotional song. When I played it through the years, I look out into the audience and sometimes people are brushing away a tear. You know, it's kind of their, their own personal memories. Uh, I, I, sh I should say a tear of pleasure, you know, not of pain. But uh, they're kind of like, wow, you know, like they're thinking back to incidents. And, like, and it's, it's a wonderful feeling to have an emotional song like that. It started off as a sort of uh, a country and Western sort of jam. And then we kind of put an orchestra on top of it. So it's kind of grown in size. Yeah. But uh, originally, but um, it's quite a sort of romantic song, and I find there aren't that many romantic songs around now, are there? There are some, but it's good to have a romantic song in your set. Yeah, tears of pleasure. That sounds like an ABC title, right there. Yeah, yeah, itself. maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I've just got the same twelve words that I just kind of yeah, regenerate. Yeah, I don't think most acts have though, don't they? Bruce Springsteen does it, you know. Oh sure. Car. 
factory. Mary. Yeah, yeah. that in there. Yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah, why not? Um, with the 40th anniversary, is uh, is there going to be a spotlight on uh, on on uh, Man Trap as well? Ah, uh, good question. Actually, yeah, um, a bit frustrating, really, because as I say, 40 years ago, uh, in 1982, we started out. Uh, the label Universal in Europe were putting together the uh, Atmos Five mix. Stephen Wilson's done a, a, a an incredible Atmos Five mix of the Lexington Love, and uh, we were putting out uh, Man Trap our film on Blu-ray and uh, I'm sorry, what was your first, what was the question there about, about. Yeah. Is it going to be celebrated as well through all of the, through all of this, you know, 40th anniversary uh, of it as well. Yeah. Uh, put all this, uh, this whole bag of incredible things together, but it's coming out next March. And I said to them, well, you know, that means it's the 41st anniversary, but I've noticed that happens a lot. So yeah, there was a plan to put everything together from that period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is. Uh, Lexicon I Love wasn't. It was very, it, it very popular in Europe and uh, the UK, but less popular in the USA. I think mm -hmm. popular, but not you know mega mega. It, in, in Europe, it was kind of it, it took off. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Well, and that, that's what I uh, got to get to. Like, uh, like there's a box set though coming, right? I mean, what what all yeah. do we expect from the uh, what what all is going to be in the box set? A uh, Blu-ray of uh, Man Trap, a film we've made with Julian Temple, um, various live recordings, I think, and uh, an Atmos 5 mix, which is, uh, you know, where you get the chance to see all the detail, the digital detail of the record and various things, yeah. But yeah. unfortunately, it's not out now, so it's out next March. Yeah. Right, right. So 41st anniversary, right. right. That's... Yeah, yeah. yeah. 41st. <laughs> so it means I, can, I don't get to retire. I'm going to go, I'm going to stagger along for at least one year. Yeah. <laughs> You start a new trend, the 41st anniversary trends, to hell with the big round numbers. I'll be honest with you, I'm the kind of guy, I don't really celebrate birthdays, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I kind of, uh, some people love to have an enormous party, don't they, each time, but I, I'm kind of, some people go in the opposite direction, I, I'm one of those guys, yeah. yeah. I go under the radar, so yeah. I only do it on the big ones, I like the big ones, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, anything with a zero after it yeah sure yeah. right right um this one doesn't have a zero and i'm gonna hit it anyway and that's 25 years ago 1997 uh skyscraping came out yeah which uh, in itself is a great record as well it, it's you know as you've already mentioned every record was a moment for reinvention for abc which you know as a fan is something that i always loved when you're in the 90s, when you're in 1997, and we're yeah. joking about what the 90s look, I mean, how hard is it to change people's perceptions? And who did you want to be on that record? Uh, with Skyscraping, uh, I got together with uh, with Glenn Gregory, a guy from Heaven 17, and a guy called Keith Lowndes. Uh, and that record came out. I mean, I realized in the 90s, I'd look around and the landscape was very different. You know, there's a point every artist, every act meets, uh, every band comes to where you're just out of sync with public taste, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And in order to kind of have any longevity, you have to kind of walk through that particular forest and come out the other side, basically, yeah. And I think you'll, you know, you, you find most artists do that kind of thing. There's a period when it goes cold and then it gets hot again, you know? So, it's an interesting time. It, it really does test your resolve, you know, uh, to, when you think you're putting out records and people aren't really listening. Uh, but I think everybody goes through that uh, when I look back now. Uh, with Skyscraping, I kind of went to my record collection and I thought I love like uh, Pistols, uh, Roxy, Bowie. And, and it was kind of like on that record, um, it was just a labour of love. We just, it was the only real time where I've just made a record completed it and then taken it into the label. Do you see what I mean? It was just mm -hmm. kind of homemade uh, skyscraping, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I just remember grabbing my mountain bike with Glenn and Keith and just spending a whole summer uh, making that record, yeah. yeah. So it's a funny, it's not really, uh, there's a couple of nice songs on there, Light Years and Stranger Things, I guess. Oh, Rolling but, uh, Sevens is a favorite for me. That guitar uh, on there, so good. Um, so it's kind of nice to drum, you know, grab a couple of those songs and put them in the set now. But um, that's where skyscraping came from. Yeah, it was kind of just a labor of love, basically. Yeah. It's kind of, it's nice now with something like Spotify, where you get a chance to kind of put nine of your albums up and people get to hear the successes, the commercial successes, the failures, 
but there's a kind of line through everything which suggests you know what we're about um so back then uh, you put a record out and then walk away from it but it's kind of nice to have a kind of back catalogue of kind of very mixed music you know uh, that, that, that's a kind of nice thing to have because i've noticed people check out a whole career now don't mm-hmm. they with every act yeah mm-hmm. Yeah. No, as a music nerd, that's uh, that's the best thing about streaming. Is you're right. It 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 uh, levels the playing field of a discography. Is what it does. Yeah, yeah. I never thought that would happen because uh, back in the day when you make it, it was fiercely competitive. And if your record got to number three, you go, "Who's at number two? You know, you never took time to enjoy it. Ask anyone. That was how it was. You know, it's yeah. crazy, crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well. Fixed. If uh, if if you ever feel like uh, pulling one from that Rolling Sevens, I think uh, I would love to see that one live these days. So just yeah, to, nice. as a fan, that's that's my request right there. That's uh, yeah, nice. One. Yeah, and and by the way, yeah, you know, it's been a few years now, but your cover of Creep, uh, Radiohead's Creep, was uh, yeah, so, so good. It was so, and it still sounds so good. A guy got in touch with me. He said, "I'd like some uh, some kind of." Established bands to do covers. Is there a song you'd like to cover? So we covered um, Radio Ed Tune. And he said, can you do it in your inimitable style? So it sounds like they have covered you years later. It was a kind of ridiculous concept. So I've always loved, uh, actually it wasn't Creep, it was, uh, yeah. Uh, high and Dry. Don't oh, High and Dry, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, don't leave me dry. I've always loved that song. I've always thought there was a lot of depth in well, uh, Radiohead. The songs do have a lot of depth, but with that particular song, I kind of thought it was all about you know sobriety and there's a lot of de- and how far you push yourself and there's a lot of great things on that lyric. So we did a version. The version you're referring to mm-hmm. is got all the pizzicatos and every ABC cliche going, but performing that song. Yeah, so I'd. It was kind of like trying to take that song and take it into a different time, get grab a time machine and you know. Uh, so it's that one of the few covers I've done actually through the years. Yeah, I'm not, I've not really covered that many songs. Well, um, usually, you know, I mean, it's, so, yeah, I at know, some point, and it's a beautiful melody uh-huh. as well. Uh, so you know, that helps. As I say, at some point, you know, it seems like a lot of artists they'll pull out the covers album. Like that's that's kind of a tradition. Is it could that be on the horizon for you still? Because if, we don't what. what's that? Well, well, people dry up, don't they? They can't be bothered to write a new song, <laughs> and then uh, the record company go, you know, we need something from you, and then the vanity project comes over the horizon. You know, the, you got to be careful with the vanity project. I mean, I've liked I like pinups when Bowie did it, and I loved uh, these foolish things. Brian Ferry did a cover mm-hmm. version. Of but there aren't many uh, occasions where you want to, you know, you don't want to hear McCartney do covers, do you? You know, you just want to hear him do his songs, you know, so there's never heard of that. Although sometimes it's kind of great to, for a cover to come from a, a, a song from a totally different angle. You know, I kind of like these stripped down cover versions. In fact, I was walking through the shopping mall this morning, Westfield in Shepherd's Bush, north of uh, London. West of London, and someone, were, yeah, somebody done a version of When Doves Cry, and it sounded incredible. I don't know, in a total sort of like an R and B tradition, uh, Prince song. So it, that it's great if you cover something and put it in a different light. Yeah, shine a light on it. Right. So then, the obvious question: If you're not going to do covers, I mean, uh, is there another record on your mind? You've done a sequel to Lexicon of Love. Is there a trilogy? Could you pull that off, or now do you go in a different direction? I was going to say uh, it'd be great if Harry Styles covered The Look of Love or something like that. Uh-huh. You know, I'm open to people covering our songs, definitely. <laughs> uh, the Lex Gonna Love 2 is an album I made about four or five years ago, yeah. Uh, I mean, at the time I said, you know, I was quite used to kind of watching uh, Breaking Bad, you know, 36 episodes on Netflix or something. The idea of not just being one episode, but kind of how a story unfolds. And I was thinking... I started thinking, what would it be like if Ziggy Stardust had, had a sort of uh, follow-up? You know, it never, it'll never happen. Um, or, you know, if you took, uh, you know, if you went to season two with certain records, it would be, it would be fascinating. So that's what set me off with the Lex Null Up Two. Yeah, is that it's quite an orchestrated album. Maybe um, I don't know if I'd call it Lex Three, but I definitely. Um, 
be interested in write uh, in in, a, in quite emotional songs. Yeah, in the context of kind of dramatic orchestration and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that. It, with 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 those record with that record, everything was big. You know, every, the drums didn't want to sound like that. They wanted to sound like that. You know, it was all about scale. So I think it would be fun to make a record like that, but it's not really what present day tastes are about, really. But it, so maybe it's a good time to do it. Yeah. yeah. See, here we are all the way back to that. You go, go against back present to the day. Yeah. It, larger than life, exaggerated, uh, musically. Yeah, yeah, that would work for me. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. You know, we've referenced uh, Ziggy Stardust twice yeah, no, I, in this I, one. Uh, and we did street, the picture. I just I walked down Regent Street as well this morning. Oh, uh, wow. where that photograph. Yeah. That's well, you it. know, we didn't get the sequel. Well, it's a painting, isn't it, of a photograph? Yeah. yeah. I was say we didn't get the sequel to that, but we got like the whole story of Major Tom for the most part. So yeah. Was, yeah. I always like the way, but we kept sort of jumping back to his characters and. In a way, uh, Thomas Jerome Newton was Ziggy Stardust, you know, uh, the man who fell to earth character mm -hmm. that seemed to write songs about in later life, uh, you know, seemed to kind of tie in with all of that. Yeah. yeah. All the way to the Black Star. Nothing, yeah, with Black Star. It's beautiful. Yeah. Right? yeah. That's a, a great way to tie that character up. I, I love it. I love it when artists do that. I mean, that's, you know, fan dream right there when you get kind of that through line. Uh, yeah. So the, the the cast of characters is there and they with any anybody and they kind of drift in and out yeah i think that's true of life too it's like your friends you run into friends you've not seen for years and you, you know it's, it's great yeah. instantly you kind of you know just hanging out yeah well uh whatever you do next i'm going to be listening i'm going to be watching well um, thanks Al. that's kind yeah. of you to say that now, uh, Martin, uh, it's it's such an honor to talk to you too. Congratulations, congratulations on forty years of being a trendsetter uh, and everything that you've done. I cannot believe you're talking to me. My forty years, it's like starting over. Yeah, but yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, and I hope you have fun out on the tour. We'll be seeing yeah. you on the state side. Yeah, thank you very much. All right.